in this box is this. <laughs> that does not get old, <laughs> ever. Good thing hit and you just thought, I'm gonna die. It was very disorienting when it came back. All I knew was that it was very cold and really loud. Uh, I had no headset, my glasses were gone. I couldn't read the panel, I couldn't communicate. Uh, it was, I didn't really know exactly where I was at first. We're here at the Vans Aircraft Company, the number one kit build airplane builder in the world. Here with Greg, he's gonna give us all the down low on what goes into that box. Ready? Do the tour. Yeah, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Welcome to Kay. Vans. Yeah, this so we it. got, I mean, there's just stuff everywhere. Uh, we have a lot of stuff. A yeah. lot of so stuff. So we're in the warehouse right now. The magic's made over there in the factory, and this is where the magic comes to, okay. to sit for a little while, and then it gets put together in boxes and gets shipped to folks. That's uh, So you make all, like, these parts, you'll make them all here in-house, put them on the shelf? Most of the parts are made here. There's some stuff that gets made at third parties. So right. we have partners that do fabrication for us, and there's some things that we buy as well. We don't make... Wheels and brakes, for example. Right. We don't make avionics or yeah. you know, instruments and things like that, but uh, it's sheet metal airplanes and a whole bunch of aluminum. This is a crate, so this looks like an RV10 RV10 tail kit. So this will be the tail cone and the uh, horizontal vertical stabilizers, and that's hardware. Hardware oh, goes in the box right nuts there. Nuts and bolts and rivets. <clears throat> exactly, the hardware to build the kit. We have our own wood shop, builds the crates. Uh, you'll see, you know, as we go through, you see all the punch presses where the, uh, it's a punch and die type of CNC Oh yeah, machine. cause this is just like a little dimple. No, oh, these holes are already out. in place and it's matched holes. So you have, these are the skins, so you have the holes here, but they'll line up with the holes in the substructure too. Oh. So all those holes are already there. Here's no jig, it's a self-jigging kit. So it puts itself together, so to speak, it lines up all like that. So you just like you just line check up the for holes. You deeper and... where necessary, and you start start riveting, dimple where, not, where, where it's a dimpled kit, and then start riveting it together, and, and uh, you just start from scratch. You know, now, start from the beginning and go to airplane. So now this is for the people that <clears throat> like a lot of work. We do have quick A little more kits. put we together do. than Yeah, we can this, go right? take a look at one of those if you want to over here. Yeah, because I'm There's... impatient. Yeah. Quick build, I, I want to get flying. <laughs> I'm... Quick builds. I'm Quick more builds of a, can save hundreds of hours of work. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, airplane, so. Spinner back plates even? Yep, spinner Holy back cow. plates, yeah. Ribs over here in the containers. Ribs. Is that where Adam's <clears throat> rib went? Is that? Yeah, that's exactly where it went. So, oh, Spar we got- Spar center sections and yeah, cabin tops and doors for the RV-10 we got here. All kinds of cool Airplane stuff. tops. So come on over here, we'll take a look. Yes, about Engines. Quick hey, look at that. <clears throat> huh. There you go. That's funny. <laughs> So here's a couple quick build oh, kits that you can yeah. see. Oh, yeah. See, this is what I'm talking about. So this is an RV-14 quick build. This is what this fuselage quick build. Yeah. Next to it is an RV-10 fuselage quick build. And that's in the box that I was just on. Yep. That, well, the box that you were just on, yep, that one too. It could also be this one. It's actually the same box. Oh. So, or close to the same box. So, there you go. Uh, it just depends on what's fitting in there. You got RV, uh, we'll see some wings as we go, quick build wings as well. So you can either build the kit by we send you a box full of parts and you yeah. that all these parts are just loose parts in the box with all the hardware um, and you build this and then you keep building beyond this or you can get a box that has this in it and this is your starting point and it also has all the other parts that go with it yeah so basically it's how much is finished for you when you get the box full of fuselage kit so who like to me this seems overwhelming to get a little tiny, like all these little pieces and have to do that, like holy cow, that's... It's a, I mean, it's an elephant. That's <laughs> an insane but, amount of work. But you know what they say, you know, how do you eat an elephant? Sure, yeah. yeah. One bite at a time. And that's, that's really what it is. It's step by step. And the instructions for the RV-14 or the RV-10, for example, it's like, it's a, you know, 11 by 17 page with drawings on it of what you're working on at that moment. Step one, step it's two, like a Lego step three. Kit. Yeah, it's like... A it's really not, big Lego It's not quite kit. paint by numbers. It's a little more complex than Ikea, but it is literally drawings right there with instructions right next to it. And you go yeah. from step one to the final step, and you go from the beginning to finished airplane. It's That's crazy. It's really doable. I have the Lance Air and stuff like that, and that mm -hmm. guy spent 8,000 hours in four or five years. Like he was- Fiberglass airplane. Yeah, he yeah. was so hardcore meticulous about all so the stuff. So there's two things that really have a major impact on how long it takes to build an airplane. Um, one of them is um, the level of technology and the completeness and the, the way the kit is put together to start with. So on the more modern end of things, you have 
kits that are all pre-punched, so they're CNC punched. They're you know the specification is ten, within ten thousandth of an inch. Oh yeah. But wow. our but our operators actually tend to hit right around within two thousandths of an inch, right? So together, and that saves hundreds or thousands of hours on a kit. Oh yeah. When you do it that way, it also means that it's much more buildable to be consistent, right? I mean, you can yeah. put it together and it's easy. The other thing for any given kit, if you're building it or I'm building it or somebody else is, is it's the perfectionism mm. element, right? Kind of say, you know, we're not going to Mars, we're going to Denver. Man, okay. Yeah. We got engines and cow, I see engine cowlings here as well. Yep, fiberglass, fiberglass cowls, tops and bottoms there. Yep, just boom. All sorts together. of stuff. Fairings and spinners. And How many boxes would I get if I just said, I want the whole airplane, send me. Like if you're doing an RV 14 or something like that? Yeah. The first one you get would be your tail kit, so that's number one. The second one would probably be the wing kit. That was a tail kit in there, yeah. Okay. Probably a wing kit, normally. A fuselage kit would follow that typically, and then a finishing kit, which is, once you've built the basic airframe, it's all the stuff that goes on it, like the canopy and gear legs and stuff like that. Then you would have, uh, optionally, you could do a firewall forward kit, which is sort of the plumbing and all the stuff that goes on the engine forward. So you guys would be able to have like all the hoses and everything here made for that yeah, kit. Yeah, the firewall forward kit is done, yeah. So for the engines that we oh. specify as standard for the airplane, we have firewall forward kits that are pre-packaged, so you can just oh order that gosh, kit that put together. that is so much easier. And it all fits, even covered in the plans. So, and we also sell Lycoming engines, so you know, you can order a Lycoming engine through us. We deal in the propellers and whatnot. We even, have discounts when you buy an engine or propeller at the same time and you know, try to find different ways to make it possible for people to be able to build the airplane. Man. Let's, Let's see the factory? Yeah. Let's do that. Huh? All right. Holy cow. All right, what do we got happening? So we got, this is our CNC area. Okay. So we have a couple of mills and we have a CNC lathe. Yeah. So here we make spar bars. Is that, and this is your spar right here, right? Yeah, this is the spar webbing. You can see spar bar riveted to it there. And what right. does the spar bar do? Is that just a strengthening? Yep, this it just keeps it's getting a strength thicker thing. Thicker. And so you can see where it attaches to the fuselage as the wing is loaded up. Oh, this up. is on inside the wing. This, this is inside is the wing. wing spar. Wing spar, yep. Oh, I see. And this is turned flat now. It would be turned 90 degrees facing you. It would be in the fuselage. Yep. So it attaches to the fuselage down here. Wow. So this is actually carbon spar bars right now. Carbon? CNC cutting. Milling. It's milling it. Yep. Working on our next order of 1700. So out of that big old chunk of aluminum come these strips? No, sir. They uh, start as an extruded piece. Okay. We're just putting the holes in. Gotcha. They're, they're clamped in. Oh, they're clamped in. That's yeah. what clamped I was like. Okay. At a time. So this is called a VA-140. It's used all over the place. <laughs> I make a lot of them. Yeah. <laughs> 1700 you're making right now? Yes. Oh, this wow. order is for 1700. Yeah. yeah, so. I love machining of all the, the stuff. Yeah. Taking like a raw chunk of something and making some yeah. finished thing and then we go old school manual mill manual you know there's still quite a bit of manual work that gets done more and more is done in a more automated fashion but there's still some things that are done that way now, so is that what was making all this, this? Is actually something that's being done over here oh so that the, he's doing over the there the coping mill would do this cut. that's a yeah. coped too right so it's going to cut the exact cut that's necessary it'll come through it'll cut this off mill that shape out of it right there oh and he's here like doing yeah. Electronic witchcraft. <laughs> a tie down block. RV12 tie down block? Yeah, yeah you yep. got it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, is this the highlighted blue, the uh, raw piece that goes in, and the lines are where you're going to yep. where you're gonna cut out? Yep. And that's how you that's, place it in the machine and yeah, everything? We'll do, uh, we'll do all, see the angle cut gets cut on the oh, back there? Gets cut there. And then you get drilled and tap on this hole here. And then there's some milling off the top of the side, so it rotates around and gets all that one shot. Holy crap. What's your favorite part of all the process stuff here that, that you guys do? <laughs> I like it all. It's all it's all beyond me, honestly. So I like just learning a lot. The the CNC punch presses that you'll see are pretty impressive. What it allows us to start with and do is really amazing. Our CNC center over here with the mills and the lathe and whatnot is a pretty new piece that we've sort of vertically integrated and brought in-house. My favorite part is the people, honestly. I mean, we just have a bunch of really cool people here that can do amazing stuff, so. A big cutting break and... Yeah, yep. It's a big a big shear, metal yeah. shear. Yeah. So we have a combination of, we got CNC stuff, we got precision, and then we also have 
brute force type stuff, right? Yeah. So we have this big hydraulic, 550 oh. ton hydraulic press. What? Tell me, don't lie. You guys put stuff in there. Just I want to put bowling balls and stuff like that in there, but we haven't done it yet. So we're, we got a lot of parts to make. But what you guys should do is take competitors' parts. <laughs> yeah. We, anyway. have, we have brute force. We have the precision stuff, like the CNC stuff you've seen. Old, you know, 1940s models of this kind of thing that people have taken and added CNC you know, oh, mechanisms to yeah. to drive them. But what this does is this does the big compound swoopy curve bends, like you know this kind of stuff that you see here. Oh right. This is actually so this starts as a flat piece, and then it gets rolled and it gets bent. <clears throat> so oh. what this does allows you to do the variable bends and the program it in, and then run it through. This is a really small piece. We'd be doing great big huge skins like the ones you saw in the crate. Like for the have, tail section have, on that. The tail vertical. section that have the big long roll in it. That's that's what this machine is for. Oh, that's cool. Everything starts out as a flat piece. So this is a flat piece. There you go. You can hold that. Yeah. Here's a form block. Oh. So you see these two, you have tooling holes that'll fit, that'll fit right over. So oh. it rides on there. So there's a shuttle. The shuttle will come out with a big, big uh, metal hard table on it. You set this on there. You fit these on the tooling holes. You can do multiple at one time. It's a sure. four by six foot uh, table. And sugar a 550 ton press comes down with an elastomer <laughs> pad. Basically just, you can see here, right? It wraps those over. Oh, so the, this edge and everything, it just bloop. If you look at it this way. Oh, uh, yeah, there you go. That part bends into that part and those holes. I mean, just this, if you had your brake at home and going right, right. It would take forever. Right. Man, you'd be there for days. Well, and the holes would line up. That's, yeah. So when it's finished, one of the steps here is that it gets labeled with the part number. So F, which means it's a fuselage part. Okay. 01417R. So that's an RV14. This is gonna be, uh, this goes in the floor of the RV14. The right, there's a right and a left. Okay. Get made. The very first kits, what did you call it, the three? Or? The three and the four and the six are kind of yeah. the early kit. And you're talking several thousand hours to build. It depends on the person a lot. Yeah. Right, but at least a couple thousand hours. Yeah, a couple yeah, thousand hours. Typically. Uh, the RV14 is the most recent kit. RV12 is pulled rivets, right? So it's not even solid rivets. You, you drop the rivet what? in, use a pneumatic puller. We'll oh, see. Come I'll on. show you. I'll show you that. RV14. Because you just our big <laughs> side. <laughs> pretty much, yeah. That's RV14 awesome. is our big side by side airplane. It's solid rivets, solid flush rivets, but. <clears throat> Again, it's all final size and it goes together really, really fast. So people have built RV-14s. I'll show you an RV-14A that we have over in the hangar. Here we have some CNC bending brakes. We have a wide variety of different tools and shapes. Oh, wow. Radiuses on them for doing different types of bends. So we can do really small parts like this. These are all the uh, the dies that they put in the, in the brake machine to make sure they get the right angle and pitch and everything. So this one, we go upside down on one of those and we'll do it. Right. You can see the tools there. He has a small, very small tool. It's inserted in the slot in the top and clamped in the bottom. And so what you know, has it? That is cool. The parts, when you build one of our airplanes, we can make parts today to replace a part that was made 10, 15 years ago or so. Oh, wow. And it will be an exact, exact replacement. Sure. And clearly this is not your first rodeo. So you yeah, said 51 years. 51 how many years. how many kits all together? Kits sold. Kits sold. Uh, a lot. <laughs> so I so I can tell you how many about how many serial numbers there have been. Okay. That's like over 26,000. Yeah, holy 26,000 <laughs> serial numbers. That doesn't include maybe the people that started it and didn't go too far with it or anything like that. So serial number is assigned when you buy the tail kit, the first kit. Oh, that is the first kit. So that's not the number that it flown. Right, But of there course. are more than 11,000 that it flown. So Which is amazing considering a lot. a lot of other kits, it's yeah. like a, I don't even know, maybe yeah. a five to one ratio. Yeah, right close to 11,000. So. Yeah, wow. So over here, we oh. have three CNC punch presses. So. Most of our parts are made out of like big sheets of aluminum. And so that have, thing is punching right now. Yeah. So, <laughs> so it's like a turret and it's a it's a punch turret. So think of it as a punch and die type of mechanism. You have a sheet of aluminum 
and you can see there's like orange and green and yellow and blue handles on there. Each of those is a tool. So what'll happen is after it's done using this tool, the machine, what it's gonna do is it'll actually go over, drop that tool off, the parts that are needed with that. Yep. So we, all of our scrap goes to recycle. Yeah. So you can see we got all kinds of, you can see there's all kinds of shapes that get punched out, whether it's round or rectangular. That's crazy. All different kinds of things. So this is a round one. So we call this a to it. Yeah. Right? When you get around to it. So you get around to it. Yeah, that's right. One of these days I'll get around to it. That's right. No, oh, I got it. You, you finally got around I to it. I finally got around to there it. There you go. So when we make these parts, punch the parts, this is the Rev Zero part. This is like the original. Oh. So when we make new parts over the years, they're all compared to that original. Wow. We don't compare it to the ones we made last week, or last month. We compare it to the, compare it to the very first ones that were made. But so that does is that how long ago was this piece made? Because it looks like it's been there. A That's minute. a good question. I don't know the answer to that. It's an RV14 part, so it's probably about 10 years ago. Wow. Right around there. Oh yeah, and here's this is clearly <clears throat> an older one. Yep. So we have a whole library of these R0 parts. And when it gets re revised and changed, then obviously there's a new one that becomes the first part that we use for comparison and, and uh, evaluation. So these are the these are the punch tools. Like here, so this is a radius. So this is a that's, so that'll that's cut the out shape that, that shape right there. It cut out that shape in the sheet metal. And again, it can be oriented 360 degrees. So you can go chunk 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 and cut a hole a hole with this radius. Oh yeah, it's it. switching uh, things now. Chunk 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 chunk. So there's a round hole. Oh, okay. This is a great Doug's, big, huge round hole. Doug's got a big hole right here. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, that'd be sound effects for a movie, like. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty neat. All right. So we got raw tools, and then they go back into the warehouse where we first came to. And then they get stacked up and uh, packed into crates, carefully packed so that nothing gets damaged and so everything can get to its destination safely. As long as nobody runs a forklift through it, yeah. on the way. Yeah, so we actually get this, these big sheets of metal. And actually, when it comes in, it doesn't even have this blue vinyl on it. We put the blue vinyl on right there to protect it. Oh, Comes through that roller. Oh. And then it gets stacked up here, and then it gets picked up from here and taken to the punch press. And then from the punch press, it goes <laughs> to the bending and forming, and goes through QC, and then it goes to the warehouse. Oh, That's okay. Well, this is Jimmy's world. We kind of did a few things backwards. Yeah, that's, that's, right. that's fine. So then all the warehouse the little bits are over there. You have yeah, this somebody is, that puts together. We have a lot together. of the warehouse, two, two sections to the warehouse. Upstairs, up in the mezzanine, oh, we have crap, I didn't even see that. other stuff. So that's where all of our hardware inventory is and a bunch of other parts and some of our practice kits and things like hats and shirts and avionics and alternators and your stuff. accessories and ancillary stuff. Yeah, a lot of that stuff. Pretty much what's up there is, is other stuff that you would order. Doesn't necessarily go into the kit. Uh, and most of the stuff that's down here is stuff that goes into the, the, the main kits that we do. So a lot of options up there. If you decide you wanted to buy seat harnesses, for example, the seat belts and gotcha. stuff, you know, those would be up there. That All right, so then the big question becomes how much, right? So minus mm -hmm. the engine and propeller and avionics. Yep. Minus those out. Yep. What's the price range on a kit? I guess the interior, you'd have to have somebody yeah. do the interior too, so right? So the interior is generally is something that a person chooses to do. That There's various businesses that do interiors. So we don't make interiors here. Okay. For the RV12, there's a standard interior that you could order. Right, right yeah. For the RV12, it's a light sport airplane. So it's the only one where we actually provide the avionics kit and the interior um. and the engine and the propeller as part of the kit. Um, because that's the way the light sports standard works. Oh, interesting. You gotta on love the, government regulation. Yeah, yeah, on the experiment. Lord knows that's the truth. started. Basically, it depends on which airplane you're building, right? So, but to buy all the kits, assuming you're not doing quick build, assuming you're oh, doing standard Oh, that's true, yeah, because they'd be kit, less expensive, right? Yeah, you know, if you're buying, a, building an RV-10 and you're doing quick build, you're gonna be adding Twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars to the price of the kit. Fair. You know, okay. So you're going to be going from the sixty thousand dollar or forty forty to fifty thousand dollar range to the sixty to seventy thousand dollar range for the kit. Gotcha. You know? okay. And then you're and then you're adding an engine, which is going to be about that much again for an RV10. A yep. propeller, which is going to be anywhere from ten to twelve to twenty-six thousand dollars, depending on what how fancy you want to get. What kind a of a propeller for? A you want to buy a three-blade composite oh, carbon? Yeah. Okay. Super fancy propeller. They they're expensive, you know. But if yeah, you want to buy the the two-blade 
aluminum blended airfoil prop, which is also happens to be the highest performing propeller, you know, then you know you're you're looking at somewhere around you know in the eleven to twelve thousand dollar range, somewhere in that range. So sure, it's not least expensive kit. Yep. Minus engine prop, avionics, and interior. Yeah, you're in about the thirty to thirty-four thousand dollar range if you want. Okay. To do that. You know, I mean, about, then, about thirty-four thousand dollars. You want to build an RV seven, the basic kits without yeah. quick build or anything like that, and you're going to go really, really basic. Then you're in about that range, somewhere in there. And you're just going to fly with an iPad and a Sentry box and yeah, I mean, that, call that, it a day. That's going to be the airframe kits. Yeah. Right. Then you're going to buy an engine. You're going to buy a prop. But you know what? If you do that and you go and you have a good solid used engine, right? I mean, you know how to find used engines. If anybody knows how to find them, you do. You find I don't a good know about solid good engine. ones, but we oh, find them. Solid. <laughs> good is good though, right? Yay. A solid, you know, a serviceable, reliable, safe. We'll call it safe. How's there that? There you go. Uh, propeller. You, know, you can do super basic VFR avionics. You, know, you don't have to put lights on if you're not going to fly it at night. That's so true, yeah. There's a way, and there's something to be said for keeping it light and keeping it simple and keeping it inexpensive and just... Less stuff that goes wrong. Just get it do it. The lighter it is, the better it's going to perform, you know, and... That's um, my Lance Air. It's pretty stripped out basics as it gets. And there's something to be said for doing it that way. And a lot of, a lot of people will build it, you know, I mean, you can build, you can build the Willys Jeep version you know right. or, or you can build the escalate yeah you know? and there's a whole bunch of stuff in between and it's really a matter of choice so you, starts, can, you can build a pretty start cool just you know, rough numbers say 35 grand to get into the the kit not including making it go yep right yep and then it just goes up from there so yes. however much money you have we can spend it Pretty much. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Just in avionics, you could have yeah. 75 grand just in your avionics and electrical stuff. Easy. It's Two a, glass screens, you, you got your you alternate could put, and your you could autopilot put a lot of money into all that stuff. And oh, good lord. No doubt about it. Yeah, so. and your engine, even if you get like a hot rodded, you know, custom build, balanced, and, you know, real, real nice one, you're talking close to 100 grand. Yeah, uh, so... And that's just for the four-cylinder one. The good thing is is that you could actually buy the hot rod six-cylinder engine for an experimental amateur build and spend under 100 grand still. You could do that. So that dude back there is building the boxes. He's building crates. They actually get they get filled up over here. Oh, okay. So he builds the crates over here. This is the wood shop. Got our own little Home Depot going on. So we have our custom crates being built. So he's got... Carpentry <laughs> happening. Which which one are you making here? Uh, 12 finish. RV 12 finish kit box crate. Nice. Cool. And we don't need a lot of this. I mean, it's... yeah. Yeah. Cool. So Build the, the crate. So it's an interesting thing, actually. <laughs> there you go. Perfect. So the material you're standing in here is this. The wood is actually the most regulated material in our factory. <laughs> what? So, I know, isn't that weird? Wait, hold on. How? You're making airplane parts and things like that for yeah. kid builds, but how is the wood the most... Because we ship internationally, and it has to be certified test-free, kiln-dried, and all that kind of stuff. Because when you... What? It's because it's wood, right? Because it's an organic material. So when this ships, there's more regulations around the plywood than there is around the aluminum and the, other, and the other parts. I know, it's crazy. All right, we got an airplane flying over, but here's all the documents for the wood crate it's in. Exactly. Yeah. So is that like what all these, this stuff here is for? Yep, so we actually, so that's, that's the label just for the wood that we order. And then the certification comes with the wood when we get it from the manufacturer. So you see, you have when to we have put like it together, we actually put a stamp on it after the crate is finished with the certification for the wood, and it has to go on every piece of wood. Oh my on lord! Crate. If it's going to go international, it has to have that on it. I mean, I guess in, they don't want in order to ship it. Sending bugs I mean, into other countries yeah, that don't belong species here. species and all that kind of stuff, obviously. Is, Snakes on a plane? Is the reason why. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. yeah. There's some quick build wings right there. Okay, yeah. And so now the, the quick build kit. Mm -hmm. So let's just say I'm impatient and I've got a little bit of extra dollars. Yep. Quick build kit. Mm -hmm. That's where it's at. That's, that's right. That's so these, what I'm talking these about. are quick build wings. These are actually the state that they are in. These just came off the truck. So they're out here in these temporary cradles to be 
and they'll, be, they'll go inside and be inspected. And so these wings, right, arrive this way in this condition and with this much work done as a quick build when you get it. I was gonna say that's like almost finished because it's even got the grommets, it's got the grommets in it for in the it. wiring yeah. and everything. So basically you have Crazy. everything built. There's one skin on the bottom of each wing that has to be riveted on. So the that you can say you are close actually, the, the wing up or something? Yeah, because or? you've done the necessary steps in order to make the 51% rule for experimental amateur build. Okay, well then Even the ailerons and flaps are even built when you get it and they get attached. Oh. So you just hang them on there. So yeah, all the bearings and are in and everything. there's still work to do. You gotta do the control push rods and the bell cranks and attach stuff. That's and just like assembly kind of thing, right? It really is more yeah. assembly. The only, you're all not right. doing any fabrication on the wings, but you are riveting on and uh, doing some advanced assembly on part of it. But the point is, is that a lot of the work gets done for you ahead of time, which saves quite a bit of time. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, and I need to pause. The mystery behind the the, the 51 percent rule oh yeah the 51 percent rule is one of the most misunderstood things in amateur built aircraft uh the 51 percent rule is it's not 51 percent of the time it's not 51 percent of the rivets it's not 51 percent of hardly anything so the faa and uh, a group of people from from the industry basically have gotten together and have come together and said, there's a certain list of tasks that are done when building an airplane. Uh, and the 51% rule says that on that task list, which has like weighting and scoring for different types of tasks, is that you have to be able to complete the tasks on that list in a way that with the weighted scoring shows that one or more amateur builders, one or more, completed at least 51% of the weighted score task list. Okay. Got it. That's what it comes down to. So for our kits, what that means is we build a new kit, and we bring it all out, and we literally lay it all out on the floor, show the what's built and what all the parts look like, and someone from the FAA comes and takes a look at it, and they get their, their chart spreadsheet. out. Spreadsheet. Their spreadsheet out. Gotta have a spreadsheet. And they look yeah. at it, and then they make a determination based on the detail of what they see as to what percentage of the work do the two quick build kits represent in the overall kit? And that's where you determine, <laughs> and, then, and then they write a letter, literally we have a letter for each of our gotta, kits gotta that says it, yeah. that the quick build kit, as configured, uh, is compliant with the 51% rule. Okay. That's the way it works. There you go, that's and how it's not government that, works. It's not that one person has to do 51%, right. it's one or more amateur builders. Yeah. That's for experimental amateur build. For experimental light sport, which is what the RB12 is built as, there's no 51% rule. There's just no rule. No, you could buy an RB12 kit and go drop it off with somebody and pay them $100 an hour or $20 an hour or whatever you want to and have them build it for you, and that's legal. You can't do that with an amateur built airplane. Huh. It has to be built by amateurs. But the EA, that's the EAB, but the ELSA, the experimental light sport airplane, is uh, no 51% rule involved in it. So we got uh, all the parts in there, go yep. into the box, they get in the crate, yep. they get sent to your house, Yep. you get to open it up, look at all the drawings. Do and an inventory, make sure everything's there. Start Start, start the journey. That's right, start Now, building. you said anybody could do it. Well, like, what kind of tools are we talking about? Are you gonna need a rivet gun, sure? Yeah, but. yeah. Rivet, so there's specialty aircraft tools, rivet squeezers, rivet guns, deburring tools, but there's also wrenches and screwdrivers and all the stuff that you would normally have in a home shop. You know, band saws, drill presses, some electric drills, hand drills, probably an air compressor and different tools and stuff. But, so we have certain kinds of clamps called Clecos. Yeah. And it's just a clamp that goes through a hole and kind of expands and pulls parts together, sheets of metal together. Special pliers that are used to be able to put those in. But none of the tools are rocket science, right? I mean, it's all really pretty simple, basic hand tools and, and a few electric tools and a couple of air tools. Pretty straightforward stuff. Now this is what? This is an RV-12 IS. Okay. This is the light sport aircraft. So this airplane is one that's been built here at Vans. Will be delivered. This will actually be going to a flight school that's going okay. to operate this. Because when we build them here at Vans, you can use them as a certified airplane as a, for commercial what? purposes. What? It's called a special light sport, SLSA. If you build it at home, you would certify ELSA, experimental light sport. But when we build it here, they can actually go to a flight school. And some of them go to flight schools. All three of these will or it might go to uh, just somebody who owns it. Sure. But it can be used as a rental airplane for flight training and things See, like that. See, now that's a big deal. That's pretty cool. That's a big yeah. deal. Okay, now what price point for like the, something like a similar... This airplane finished if we build it. Yeah. This one here is, looking at the configuration, it's probably right around $185,000, $187,000. Which is expensive, however, 
The 165 Skycatcher. What's the price point of that thing? Which I have actually no idea. I have I, no idea either. Well, they don't okay. sell it anymore. Oh, they don't? What other light sport So there are certified... other, other similar types of airplanes are, are anywhere from about that point up to into the, the 220s and the 250s, you know, for a two-seat for a two seat uh, light sport aircraft generally. It's a, it's a pretty well-priced airplane. Yeah, it is. So to build, but to build this same thing, you know, you're looking at somewhere in the 130, I mean, this is fully decked out with an IFR navigator and everything, 130, $135,000, somewhere in that. So range. roughly 50 grand savings ish yeah, give or take. 40 to 50,000 yeah, probably 40 to 60 depending on the configuration and sure paint and a bunch of other things yeah no and this one this is pretty cool this is pulled rivets though right yeah so this so one's this one is you know, so you use your pneumatic pull you put the rivets blind rivet you put it in it has the stem sticking out you pull it chunk and it's done because the other ones are buck rivets flush. So solid, solid rivets solid so rivets. Be squeezed or bucked or yeah yeah and it's be flush yeah this is a light sport airplane, right? So the speed limit on it by, by the certification <laughs> type is 120 knots. That's true. Right? So you're not really worried so much about speed on this. You're just, you know, concerned about structural strength and ease of build and those sorts of things. Oh, I just, this is a handle. These wings come off in what? about five minutes. So what? A couple people what? can take these wings off in about five minutes and put it back on again. That's... So the handle is there to help you, to help you do that. It's also, a, happens to be a good place if you want to put a camera on there or something that works. That, really okay, well. being kind of light sport, light, how much does this thing weigh, roughly, empty weight? This one weighs probably, uh, I have to look it up for this one, probably weighs about 810 pounds. <laughs> That's just nuts. Yeah, max gross weight That's on this is 1,320 pounds. Good night. Which is the max limit for a light sport, 1,320. So this airplane is, you know, Again, speed limited and weight limited, right, by its, by its class. One of the things that's happening right now, be coming soon, is the expansion of the light sport rule. You're about mosaic, mosaic yes. program, which will take the light sport specification and the way the things are certified and remove that 1,320 pound limit and remove that 120 knot speed limit and will expand that significantly to allow other aircraft to be able to, instead of maybe being EAB or experimental amateur built, be incorporated into the light sport rule. And will also, in turn, separately but in a connected way, allow sport pilots, mm -hmm. as opposed to private pilots, via things like endorsement and training, to be able to move up in terms of what they might be able to fly, because right now they're limited to this light sport airplane. So it allows that expansion of those rules to enable, and when you do that, by the way, then the 51% rule goes away. That's true, right. yeah. So and, the, and frankly, it's safer, right? Because absolutely. experience, you have the tooling, you got it to build correctly. It's got more experience of building that kits and other, I mean, exactly. it's, it just makes and so much more sense. Almost 20 years ago, when they put the light sport rule into place, you know, and then over that time since then, there's been a lot of experience gained in terms of recognizing what is the safety. You know, if we do it this way, um, you know, is it safer? And the evidence is just there. Yeah. So taking what are currently amateur built airplanes and standardizing those in the way that they are built and allowing them to be professionally built, if you will, is something that just enhances safety. Yeah, it does. And, and also, you know, expands uh, the marketplace and makes a certified light sport airplane uh, more available Into to the public in a way that affordable. is different than a Part 23 airplane, which are very, very expensive. So yeah. removing something that we know works really, really well, but doesn't have all of that overhead that goes along with Part 23 uh, is something that could be really good for the aviation industry and consumers that are buying airplanes uh, bring that cost down. Yeah, I mean, you look at a, and this is just mind blowing to me, a new Archer fixed gear yep. or a new 172 or something. Yep. It's crap near a million dollars It's for it's the same technology that they had in 1965 but for the, the same thing. But the amount of paperwork and stuff that one has to do in order to get it certified is kind of crazy. But not the to light, harp on the government, but only the government could screw something up that bad. Yeah, but and just over know, time, it just compounds on each other. And and, and the thing is, is that you know the, the benefit of having the light sport category for the last 20 years is that the industry has learned from that, and the FAA has learned from that. With a ASTM standard, you know, in place, that can be expanded to be used in some larger and a little bit heavier and a little bit faster airplanes within limits in the sure. general aviation space especially is a, is a good thing. Yeah, okay, so we get, this is the finished one. Yep. So walk us through what 
like what stages that we we can see here rv12 rv12 is that's yep. up the plane that we just saw this is where that magic happens right and this is kind of sort of similar to the kit build if i was building one at home it's the same kit okay it's the same part same okay it's different the only difference is we have an assembly line for building multiple at the same time there you go so you have multiple people that are working on it but the, it's literally the same parts oh okay the same plans it's, it's it's the same airplane yeah There's and no we difference. got Whatever that is. Yeah, so these are actually used for paint paint masking. So these are these go on when we send it over to paint. But when it comes in, so here's a tail cone, for example, that's just come in. So when a, I get the first box, you said it was likely a tail section. It's a tail kit, yep. Which so includes that's this. this the tail cone here. Okay. And would also include the empennage, which is the stabilator. Yeah. Right here. Vertical stabilizer, the rudder. And we have some of those parts that are on the shelf over here. So okay. we mass produce certain parts all at once and put them on the shelf. And then we kind of bring all these parts together so that they go for a similar line, yeah. down the road. Yeah. And this particular airplane is all pulled rivets, just about. I mean, there's some solid rivets. Oh, in, yeah. It's yeah. mostly pulled rivets. So. See, that, that is cheating because now you don't have to get the bucket <laughs> bar on the backside and get it squeezed just right it go, and everything It goes else. really quick. It's a, <laughs> it's a very quick process. So, you know, you, you spend, you spend everything your time kind together, of prepping the parts and, then you're and getting boonka, them all together. Boonka, boonka. Yep. That's just cheating. And this is your spar here. That's the spar. So you can see it's that gold anodized. And again, these are made on that mill that we saw earlier in the factory, right? So oh, yeah. CNC. Yeah, and this goes all the way out through there. It has that stepped uh, yeah. thing on it. Yep. Not made out of wood. So like. this, this is different. Because right? you remember on the RV-12, you can take those wings on and off. So they actually have a, a big pin that goes oh. through. So this, is, this would be in the center of the airplane. There's another wing that comes in here. It goes like this, and so you see these two. Oh, okay, so these will line up on both wings. So they line. So the, the other spar half comes in and lines up, and then these line up with each other, and then there's a big metal steel pin that goes through there, has a locking mechanism and locks in. So it basically all locks into the airplane like this. Flight controls will come back here. Oh, yeah. Come right, right across here, right? And then and they actually pin right in. Be easier huh. to show you on the finished airplane, but that's. Okay. But they actually come in, and so there, there's a slot and fits right there, and it's a <laughs> self-joint self mechanism. It's really easy. Yeah. See how easy would that be? So there are different stations. So there's systems that are installed here. Right? Oh, I see. Yeah, this is so, a more advanced. Yep. So this part one, of it. This one's so had systems it, already installed. So that would be the part over there that would come next. That's what. It, that's what it looks like when it comes in the building. Okay. So when it comes in the building, it, it's it's basically in this condition. So these are the Clico clamps, right? So yeah. this is a, a clamp that goes through a hole. So you have all these holes clamped together to hold the sheet together, which is holding the tail cone in place. But when you take those out, then you can just take the tail cone right off because it's not riveted in permanently yet. Over here, for example, doing avionics and putting systems in, we have some uh, curtain booths in here for doing things like fiberglass and sanding and some of the more dirty stuff that goes on over there. But a whole set of different assembly line workstations, if you will, that you go through in the finishing and uh, the building of the kit. So in this one, he's installing the fuel lines, oil lines, yep. things like that. And a bunch of avionics mounts. tends to happen over here. Oh yeah, look at that. Yeah, so this one is just starting systems installation here. And this is the pin thing that you were talking exactly about over right. there. So those, those spars again come in and come together and they come through these slots right here. They'll come over and they overlap each other. Mm -hmm. You have a pin on each side and the pin goes through. But here, is you see the instructions. So you have. Oh, so this would be in the kit, and this would. This is this is the kit assembly instructions, the plans, uh, if you will, from the build plans. And so you have step one: dimple of machine countersink, the F zero one two zero three F L and R, left and right, as called out in Figure one, and apply the callouts to both parts. And that's Figure, figure one. one. And now you would find the. And you two find, zero those, three, find those three numbers F right there, and L. Mm -hmm. So that piece right there. Do do. Yep. Left and right. It's not quite paint by a, number. Adult Legos. This is it that. Really, it really is. That yeah. uh, what's the, not the Death Star with the a Millennium Falcon Lego kit. It's it's exactly the Millennium Falcon Lego kit. <laughs> yeah. So oh what's the gosh. record for kit to flying that you guys have had? Like an RV12. Whatever it is. So in 2018, we built one of these RV12 ISs at Oshkosh at, at AirVenture in a week. Seven days. Yep. Seven days. From. One quick week. build to so they do to every fly, three, to every three it? years or so they do the one week wonder right yeah we built rv12 from parts to to finished airplane in seven days it taxied and then on the monday following it actually took its first flight 
That is nuts. Yeah, it's amazing. It How was many a people lot were? Of work. I was gonna say that's insane. So there was five people from here and from our prototype shop and and our warehouse that were led the team. So five of our guys here, uh, and then there was probably about thirty core volunteers that were really experienced builders, and then there was a couple hundred of other volunteers that spent time on some kind of a shift, and thousands of people that came in and learned how to just basically just pull a rivet and put a rivet in the in the wing or the fuselage and then sign their name on it with a sharpie right yeah. next to it. So when it goes to paint and everything, when it's out of paint, then generally it will end up over in final assembly. So here you can see- So where's the, the flight in. control thing you were talking about? So that's right here, this guy. It's covered in paint because it's got tape because it's gonna get painted. Oh, that. So there's a slot here. When the aileron is attached yeah, to the wing and the wing. wing comes on, the wing slides in right here. So this is all getting ready for paint again. This we're in. So this is the bottom side. Yep. That's going to be the top. And the it trailing edges. It'd be the there. trailing edge. And then yeah. this oh. this flapper on. So this has a flapper on. So this is hanging on the back, and there's a control the control surface. So there's a mechanism where the tab comes in and slides into. And it the would slot. be in this part right here, right? Right. Yeah. After oh, it's okay. So it's yep. not on here yet. So this tab right here on this oh, end. Oh, this so tab this is tab what slides in that thing. Slides into that slot. Pivots. So it slides in and there's a tube that you don't see right now because it's what's So right there's there. not actually a control rod and a bell crank that go out to it like traditional. It's inside and it pivots Well, right it's a flap here. run, so the whole thing, this whole thing moves all in one piece. So there's nothing to go out to. It all attaches, yeah, on the inboard side. Man, that it's is just too it's cool. really simple. And these are all powered by Rotax? Yeah. The, 912 uh, IS, hence the 912. It's the RV12IS. RV12 yeah. yeah, that's where the name came from. So it's a 100 horsepower, fuel injected, uh, completely computer managed and controlled engine. So it's See, a single, single lever setup. So that's what a, I'm talking about. Yeah. So None it's of a, this stupid mixture and all this other junk. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> Okay, moving yeah. on. <laughs> All right, let's go, let's go over the other place. You can see a finished one here. So now we take it from over there. It gets paint. It comes over here. Yep. Pop the wings on, and then you're doing your finishing stuff. Yeah, so this is the assembly. final assembly building. So the, the, the guys that are doing the work over here are basically, it, pretty much when it comes out of the other building, it's kind of going to paint, generally speaking. And then it comes over here, and Adam and Trask are walking in the room right now. Wait, and hold on, hold on. the airplane. You gotta come over what here. You, what you got in your hand there? Oh. <laughs> oh, I thought it was Mountain Dew for a second. Oh, I was like, wait. You want one? Wait, no, I'm gonna mess with you. Nice to meet you. You as well. So this is your guys' uh, this, this is, is your, your world yeah, right this here? Is, this is where the magic happens. That's pretty All neat. All the final touches. Now, do you guys paint too? Oh, uh, yeah. We have a paint but, booth. Yeah. Okay. We do a little bit, yeah. We have a painter that does just paint. Okay, yeah. I was yeah, I was gonna say, that's a, that's a it's a special job. Special skill to oh, be yeah. able to lay it on without all the crap in it and runs oh, yeah. and everything else. Unique's good yeah. work. That, I mean, that's pretty cool because it's it's the legit. You got yep. all the lights and you got everything in there to cook it and the whole bit. Oh yeah, what do you think? I mean, it's that's pretty cool. The one thing that gets me is five minutes to pop the wings off. Yeah. You know, roughly. Yeah. You're, you know, it's really quick and easy to pull the wings off because it is not that way on any other airplane that I know yeah. of. Yeah. It is a chore. And then to get it back together, now that's all. And then how, say, how safe do you feel flying that thing after you put the wings back on for that first flight is uh, oh, yeah. always questionable. But this one, you just have the little tab and the two big old pins and maybe electrical connection or whatever, and yeah. it's kind of it. That's meant, pretty awesome. Meant to work that way, it's the way it's built. So it comes over here, put the wing on, final assembly. Yep. And then you wheel it out and then fly it away? Yeah, everything's checked. And then, and then our folks go through and they do the first flight on it. Okay. and do the flight test and fly the hours off and go through all the test cards and do uh, really deep, uh, complete test scenarios. Because I guess, yeah, you still got to get the airworthiness certificate and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, we've got it, the airworthiness right? certificate. By the, by the time you've done that, you've pretty much, by the time you've finished, you have the certificate. Uh, and then you're flying it and we'll fly, do all the test cards and whatnot so that it's basically a ready airplane that's already been fully tested uh, by the time the owner comes to pick it up. You can build it as a kit. You can. You can come pick up the kit and drive it home if you want. You know, most people we ship it to them. Some people do will call. You can, uh, you can build the airplane. You can buy the airplane fully finished, or you know, there's the different options for the RB12. Pretty neat. And it's a fun airplane. It's a really fun airplane to fly. 
It's not the fastest of the airplanes, but it's really nice and light and it flies really, really well. I mean, it seems like it's got a you know pretty good sized wing. Mm -hmm. It's square. It just feels, it looks from the outside like it would just be a super stable trainer platform. And it is, and it's very intuitive. Um, nice and light on the controls. Uh, lands really, really slow. So it, it's like what's uh, takeoff and landing speed on this? So doing short field, soft field, you know the whole yeah, bit. So when you're coming in, you're landing. You're I'm I'm down in the forty six knot range when it stops flying. Usually it depends on how it's loaded, of course, right? You know, but um, you know you're you're taking off in this thing at fifty something knots is when you usually leave the that, ground. Yeah, that's pretty know? good. I mean, it's pretty. My when I'm flying it, approach speed on final is about fifty. Five, fifty-six knots. <laughs> That's so crazy. Yeah. yeah, it takes a little while. That yeah, I was gonna say. I was like, you write a book while you're on final, and yeah, yeah, yep. You have That's pretty, well, yeah, and you, you said that that one was it. instrument, right? Yeah. So you're yeah, so full shooting approaches and the whole bit. Yeah, exactly. So Dang, it's crazy. configured as an instrument trainer. So you know, it's a light sport, so you don't fly it into IMC. Of course. But you can file and you can fly uh, IFR which from a training perspective is great. So this is yeah. a technically advanced airplane. You can do your instrument certificate in it. You can do your commercial in it. Yeah. All of that in private commercial. And instrument, it's all in one probably airplane. what, a third the cost of a certified airplane to operate? Oh yeah, the operating costs are quite low. I mean, it only burns. You know, if, you, if you can get it to burn more than five and a half gallons an hour at full power, you're, you're something crazy. weird. I mean, and you look at a 172. Cruising around, you're under yeah. five gallons. Yeah. That's, yeah. Yep. And it's all in that, all the way through your commercial, it's just about hours. And if it's, you need to replace a part, if you ding, ding a corner skin or something like that, you need to pop it off and replace it, then you know these parts that we make here, they pop right on and they fit every time and the holes are already in it. Yeah, and, you're, and, <laughs> and we don't we don't charge more for the part if it's experimental or we don't charge more if it's special light sport, it's the same part. you know. Yeah. So the part that might cost $30 from us is a part that costs $300 from a certified manufacturer or more. Yeah, oh yeah. You know, so I was going to say uh, 30 bucks for any part on an airplane is unheard of. Exactly. So just See that a, washer right there? Yeah. 85 bucks. bucks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Well, hey, uh, how about we... Uh, you want to go fly? We'll go take a spin. All right, we can do that. All right, let's, let's go. <laughs> now that we've built one, let's go fly one. This is the RV14A because it's got a nose wheel. The regular RV14 is a tail wheel. And he tells me that it's a uh, hot rodded like homing 390 pushing out well over 200 horse. And this is a carbon fiber or some sort of special crazy cool prop because it's experimental people. We can do a lot more cooler things than what we can in the certified world. So how cool is that? And I spy with my little eye parachutes. You know what that means? We're gonna go Top Gun. Yeah! Okay, what I'm noticing here, this is an experimental. You can see. Boom. And they say they take the mental out of experimental. I don't know about that. But what I do know is this does not look like an airplane that was built in a garage. They're, and, and they're not even paying me to say any of this stuff. They're not giving me anything. They give me a hat, I guess. But they, that's they, like, Okay, I'm a Lance Air guy, but I'm, I gotta admit, this, I'm, I'm kind of digging what I'm seeing. Uh, he said that this thing will cruise over 200 miles an hour at like probably 10 gallons an hour is what I'm guessing. Yeah, we're getting ready to go fly. Like, it is crazy to me that this is an experimental airplane because it does not look like it. And check it out inside. Got all the shiny bits and the cost wise is I mean it's airplane world so it's expensive but it's like a third of the price of a certified airplane blue knob black and red you know all that Dang, look at this he had to take the seat cushions out because we're gonna be wearing those parachutes because this one does have some acro or aerobatic depending on who you talk to acrobatic aerobatic you know potato potato so we got Yes. You know what? Enough jibber jabber. Uh, let's let's go flying. I mean, it, it could have been like in Texas or something, right? Yeah. Where? <laughs> It's not as hot here as it is. 
Man, you got like little armrests right here. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's pretty it's nice. Somebody gets spoiled it's not, in this. It's and light, but it's, there's, it's just fancy enough. There's decent room as well. We're not yeah. like no, yeah. squished in. This is the big. This is like a bigger, bigger version of the RV7. The RV7 is uh, a little more could be, friendly. We'd be touching shoulders probably. Yeah. Just barely. All right, so you, you work your magic. All right, here we go. Grip prop. Or how do we say it? Well, can I get a? Can I get a? That's right. You Go, it. give it. <laughs> Bada bing bada boom. Uh -huh. Oh right. wow. This is the first time I've ever used Message. light speed uh, light speed headsets. Uh, it's a good headset. I've, I've flown light speed headsets ever since I started Message. flying. Oh yeah. That's All a right, fantastic air for flying. Alright. Bring the flax up, laps up. Does this have a parking brake? It does. You can put one on it, but this one doesn't. We got a all right, which way he's coming? All right. Looks like he's going the other way. So in a special airspace, we call not the tower, but kind of a tower person. We'll, we'll call Pearson Advisory. Okay. Which is, so they're not a control, they're not controlling, but you have to contact them and then they provide you advisory information relative to deconflicting because uh, we're in a special sort of wedge cutout underneath the Class Charlie here. Yeah, and Portland's a pretty busy, well, it's a kind of a busy air play, air, airspace. Right. And they get a lot of big planes that come through. Here's an advisory, Aerobat 73, can I run Alpha 3 to depart runway 8 with the weather? Hey, Rick, all clear, advisory, man, the Class Charlie airspace, cost of return Portland, arriving from the yeah. west. Traffic, four miles northeast of Pearson at 2,000. Boom. Remain outside of Charlie, and we'll watch for the... Traffic at 2000, get an alpha. And Pearson Advisory Stock 61531, what's the minute departing on runway 8? Holy crap, this thing's about to go. Holy crap, this thing's about to go. Holy crap, this thing's about to go. Holy crap, this thing just got with it, man. No, it's, yeah. pretty, it's pretty quick here. Holy crap. All right, there's the other one. <laughs> Got all kinds of And there's one. There. Good lord. And calling the departure to the north. You were stepped on, Sagan. Uh, yes, this is uh, Skyhawk 61531. Uh, we already had our uh, uh, advisory call. Correct. And other aircraft calling on Pierce Advisory, Sagan. It feels nimble and stable all at the same time. That's pretty cool. Now, would you like to take the controls? Yeah. All right, your controls. My controls. Your controls. My controls. All right. Those, those down on the white bar part. A little bit lower. There you go. Oh, yeah, for there the brake. Just, just yeah, it's a practice. Yeah. Look at that. I mean, it's... Oh, yeah, hands off. It'll fly. Yeah. Let's go across across the river over here. All right, fill out the control bird right there. <laughs> right there. Oh. There he is. All right, what's our altitude? We're outside of the Charlie. Yeah, we're good to go right now, please. With the altitude here... And the more birds above us. Holy crap! Oh, no, there's birds everywhere here. Oh, my goodness. This thing is so bad. Like, one finger... Uh, yeah, it's it, the controls are heavy enough to where you can bump it a little bit, and the airplane is not twitchy. But light so, enough that it responds quickly. Yeah, because my yeah. land's there. I mean, Lord, you even look that way, the whole airplane oh, yeah. goes like this. Yeah. If you look over there, you can see there's Rainier. There's St. Oh, Helens. Helens. So I've climbed and stood on the rim of St. Helens. I, I haven't done that. That's pretty cool. It is. It, it's, the, it's the worst climb ever because it's like five or six miles uh, like this, all in sand and it's ash. It's a trail. Yeah. You take a step up and it just goes like that. You take a step up and go like that. It took us forever. Yeah. Or maybe it was 11 miles and it took us six hours. 
<laughs> Maybe it was something like that. It, it was forever. Wow. But when you get to the top of it, right. it's like God's hand just scooped out the whole side of the mountain because it goes under you and out. It's the craziest thing I've ever That's seen cool. in my life. I've flown around it a bunch of times and actually never gone up there on the ground. Oh, yeah. So one yeah. of these days, I'm going to do that. Oh, man, this visibility in this thing is just fantastic. That's pretty great. Clear high. Little more pull. Huh? Little more pull. There, ah, is, there yeah. it is, right there. Still trying to fly at fingertips, so... Yeah, it's nice and light, just touch it. Don't grab it, just touch it. Wow. Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> well, I'll uh, turn the controls back over to you. All right. Your controls? My controls. You want to wrap up the steeper turn? Oh, yeah, there you go. Cheese. Cheese. <laughs> Cheese. 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 There's three G's on the meter right there. <laughs> Your face is starting to go down. <laughs> that is fantastic. We can go from this to this. <laughs> that does not get old. <laughs> Ever. Come on, you can like, you can build some in your garage and then you just go out and do this stuff. That's ridiculous. The wing over like that, just flipping awesome. Come on. Two and a half coming out, two eight. Oh, that's fantastic. So this thing is rated for like a bunch of G's, right? Plus six, minus three. Holy cow. We're just going to go on over. And there's zero. Whee! <laughs> Unknown position. Yeah, it is. Oh, come on, how much fun is this? <laughs> Alright, so you said it's rated for how many G's? Uh, plus six, minus three. That's nuts. Now, I mean, I cannot begin to tell you how much I love experimental over certified because of the freedom that you can do. You're it's so lot, restricted with certified. Uh, it's a lot of opportunity. You can really make it your airplane, which is pretty cool. Yeah. So, you know, you have, you have the opportunity to to customize things the way you want to, to, to experiment, to change things and learn. Obviously, you need to have some sanity built into it, but uh, but it's really a pretty unique thing. It's Yeah, I was in a slightly smaller version of this, you call it the same version of this airplane, the RV-7A. Uh, and uh, the short version is had a bird strike that took out the better part of this canopy at about 200 miles an hour. And Holy crap, what kind of bird was it? Uh, don't know. Go I'm right. not sure, yeah. But it was, it, was, it happened very quickly. It was uh, dusk, dusk time and over the foothills of the mountains. And uh, it was very disorienting. It was it was very, very cold. So the wind, wind chill, it was like minus 40, 40 degrees almost. Ah, minus 40 degrees. And uh, minus 40 degrees? It, it was scary. It was really disorienting. All I can tell people, the, the, main, the main thing that I try to tell people from that experience is uh, fly the airplane and uh, don't give up. Like, don't. Wait, hold, hold on a second. I just want to, because I, you said a few things. So you were going about 200 miles an hour. Yeah, uh, give or take. You hit a bird and it blew this whole thing, like destroyed it. Uh, this, this part of the canopy came out first and the rest of it just ripped out. Airplane pitched up. Uh, it was extremely disoriented. There's a whole portion of it that I don't really have a clear memory of, right? So that's just a push pull, by the way. So, but the, the uh, yeah, came up, uh, headed downhill real fast, the mountainous area. So, without how, how dwelling too much on it. How much altitude were you at? Uh, I was at about 12,000 feet MSL, but nowhere near that many feet uh, above ground level. Were you so, out in the mountains? Or out uh, out it was the Rocky Mountain, the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. So, wow. we well past the pass, but uh, over, uh, over a wildlife refuge type area during bird migration season oh. at dusk. So I did you know, I could have taken a different route that wouldn't have had that risk associated with it. I certainly learned that won't do that again. It was a very 
very, very unlikely scenario, but you know, maybe it happens 0.001% of the time, but when it happens to you, it's 100%. And, uh, and then you got to deal with it 100%. 100%. And, uh, so what so I feel you very fortunate to be alive, to be honest with you, but um, you know, it's a, uh, it's, the one thing is no matter what happens when, when things get stressful and tough is fly the airplane. And the, they talk about some of the hazardous attitudes, and one of those is for pilots, one of those is resignation. Uh, uh, and it's a very real thing, right? I have training. Like resignation, you're off. like, I'm going to die and you like give up? I said, I give up. I'm done. Oh, my goodness. And I experienced that, you know, but then convinced myself out of it. Wait, wait, hold up. That You're like, what? So you get thing hit, and you just thought, I'm going to die. It was very disorienting when it came back. All I knew was that it was very cold and really loud. Uh, I had no headset. My glasses were gone. I couldn't read the panel. I couldn't communicate. Uh, it was. I didn't really know exactly where I was at first. Yeah, because you're at 200 miles an hour, and then all that 200 mile an hour air is hitting your face. Yeah. Well, and there's a big. This all this glass is missing, so you have a big air dam behind you back here. It's a big air break. Oh my goodness! But the airplane pitched up. Pitched up. Uh, rock wings came down and started going downhill. Pretty fast. Um, Good, nice. So, but it, I mean, the data tells the story, right? That's the thing about the electronics. So, did a did a yeah, uh, not too high, relatively high, but not too high. G pull out, uh, did hit the ground. How did you land? Like that did for a while. Eventually, found an airport. I did. I couldn't tell where I was. You flew the whole thing, and you were able to find an airport. I had about 20 minutes of flying before I could find an airport. Oh my and lord! By the time I found an airport, it was getting dark. That's insane. And I couldn't get the runway lights to turn on. So I, you were landing without a canopy when it was getting dark with no lights on the ground. Yeah, I eventually got the lights on. I was able to squint enough to be able to make out enough on the screen to. Rock 7700 because I was headed toward the Denver Tracon. I didn't, I didn't want to hurt anybody else. Uh, and then I saw a beacon on the ground, and the as it was getting dark, it was dusky. But by the time I got there, it was getting dark in the on the valley. And then I looked at the screen here, and I saw a little green dot on the screen, which kept the VFR airport. I looked over and then I saw a little green flash and a little white flash and a green flash and a white flash. So I saw a beacon on the ground, but there were no runway lights around. How did you feel when you saw that green and white flash in a runway that you could make? It was a, a bit of a sense of relief until I ended up, so you could tap a little green down on the Dynon screen here. And then I couldn't read anything, but I know where things are just from using it all the time. I was able to get to the comm radio screen where you could tune the comm radio remotely. I knew what order things would be in, so I got what I thought would be the CPAP frequency. And then I, I knew that this is soft keys down here. These keys change when you use different things on the screen, but basically just followed memory. Figured I was, I thought I was tuning it into the comm radio and then hit the flip-flop button and then I just started clicking. And the lights would flash on and then go off on the runway. So I knew the runway was there. I got a, a little bit of orientation, but they are flashing on and off. It was really, it was maddening. Here I am in this broken airplane completely panicked, totally wiped, uh, no communications. I know there's an airport there, I can't see the runway, and the runway lights won't stay on. So I eventually got slowed down a little bit, tried not to fly over the city too much because I didn't know what all was broken on the airplane. So I just slowed down, I started clicking slower, taking, taking things more segmented, if you will, really focusing on attitude and uh, found an airspeed that I knew was working and not getting too slow, calmed down a little bit, and then eventually I just clicked three times, looked, for, looked at attitude, airspeed, just trying to make sure I'm about where I need to be, and then the lights came on and they stayed on. And it was Boulder, it turned out to be Boulder. So I turned, turned around and did a quick turn and ended on a base and then landed, made a landing and <laughs> Everything was fine. How did you feel whenever you touched down and you got the plane to where you knew you had made it? You know, I wish I could say I felt like amazed or relieved or something, but pretty much I just felt like, okay, that happened. I mean, that land. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, I, it was, uh, by that point in time, I was through the panic. It was all done. Well, cause I, you, you I hit it, you were like 20 officer. or 30 minutes before, by well, the time you hit it. Yeah. So you were it was it was pretty matter of fact. I worked as a cop for about eight nine years, um, so I think I might react to those things a little bit differently than like other people might. 
I, I, I know how to deal with adrenaline and stuff, but even with all the training, as a police officer, and the training is you know, becoming a pilot, that whole resignation thing is so real. Wow, I would have never imagined that. You're just like, okay, I'm going to die, this is it, this is how it goes. Yeah, it was it was pretty much, uh, the way I explained it before, was you know, my lawn dart, that's where I'm going, is right there. So, But, you know, you kind of have the almost cliche things, you know, stuff goes through your mind, the purpose for goes through your head, you have a purpose for not, for doing something different, pulling out of it, making it work, and, I don't know, that's what happens, so. Here we are, flying wow. around on a beautiful Sunday. Yeah, man, that's amazing. But let's, let's, when we go back in, we're gonna watch for birds. Yeah, yeah, we're right. gonna, we're gonna watch if for you birds. Help me watch for in. birds, I always, I, I especially appreciate help with that these days. Yeah, I, I, hey, I can, I can feel you on that. All right, well, uh, you wanna, Take controls and we'll go back and all right, we'll head back. Here all we right. go. Your controls? My controls. Your controls. Alright. <laughs> yeah, because we gotta duck down and get below eighteen hundred feet for the first shelf, right? Yep, yep. We're gonna go down to about a thousand feet actually. How many? We, so when we cross under the keyhole we'll be low enough. Oh right. On. So you can see up here is you can see the island in Vancouver Lake. So this is the river, this is the Columbia River. Yep. And the Willamette River comes up through Portland and joins right there. And they brought this spruce goose up this way. All the Columbia, yeah, the Columbia, the Willamette. the Willamette, all the way down. And they, yep, then they trucked it once they got it to the, uh, to the locks down there. And they're some of the biggest sturgeon fish I've ever even heard of out of this yeah, river right here. Amazing, really. Just like six, seven feet long. Yeah, massive animal. A prehistoric kind of thing, man. Yeah, most of them are not six or seven feet long. Well, no, but, you But know. they're big. And they do look like dinosaurs. Yeah, just crazy. And surgeon is where they get um, caviar, isn't it? I think it's one of the fish. Is I that? I don't know. I'm not a big caviar guy. I mean, I <laughs> I work on broken airplanes all the time, so I can't afford it. <laughs> but I've heard that it's a surgeon uh, fish egg, essentially, is what it is. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for. Uh, Bring me and let me interrupt all your building and all that I don't stuff. Know. Glad to. This is a great. And we got a. Oh, that's cool. How do you not? <laughs> how do you not do some of that? All right, where's he at? ATN 3444. I'm not gonna say I'm converted, <laughs> but uh, I'll give you this. This is. A, you should. I that. am really. I'm just. I'm legitimately impressed because nothing about this feels experimental. No, it's. I mean, experimental is such a broad class. Bada bing, bada boom, that's how you do that. <laughs> a little warm in here. Yeah. Oh, turn the AC on. Nice. <laughs>